It is good to be with you tonight. Actually, right now it is the morning. It is sunrise on Lake Kaganza, just on kind of the southeast direction from Madison. And it is a beautiful place here. Most of us are familiar with the Four Lakes. Uh, since we are the Four Lakes Church of Christ, uh, the Four Lakes being Mendota, Monona, Wabisa, and Kaganza. So this is the one farthest down the Yahara River in the chain of Four Lakes, and I've enjoyed being here. hope to do a little bit of kayaking later tonight, but it is not cloudy right now. It is hazy because of the smoke that's come in from out west with all the fires there. So let's be remembering that in our prayers. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, please get in touch. Also, please remember that we are continuing to have two worship services every Sunday at 9 o'clock and also at 10.30. It is really, really helpful if you use the Sign Up Genius account. We really appreciate that. It helps in terms of communion preparation and also a number of other things as well. And if you need anything, um, if you need any help signing up, let me know or get in touch with Kenna. If you have any updates to the prayer concerns in our bulletin, give me a call at 608-224-0274 or send me an email with the contact information that will be on the screen in just a little bit. Tonight we get back to our study of the book of Luke and by way of review we know Luke is a medical doctor. Uh, he is a Gentile. He writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus and he includes a number of people groups that were often excluded or picked on or looked down upon in the ancient world. Gentiles and women and uh, Samaritans and that kind of thing. Last week we looked at Luke 17 where among other things uh, we had the healing of the ten lepers. Remember there was only one of those ten lepers who returned. The other nine were not thankful at all. And the one man returned and thanked Jesus for the healing that he experienced. And then we had some comments concerning the Lord's second coming and uh, the fact that he would return without warning. The passage, remember Lot's wife. We learned some lessons from that. And tonight we continue with Luke chapter 18. We will be using the Harmony of the Gospels tonight. In case you're interested, the Harmony is available on Amazon for about 25 bucks, give or take a few dollars here and there, depending on what day you check. And it'll get to you in a couple days, most likely. And it's basically just the four Gospel accounts in parallel form in four different columns where we have all four accounts, one column and we have one and so on. And so we can compare and contrast. It makes it a little bit easier. It's just the Bible, but it's arranged in a different way to make it more convenient. So if you don't have that, it's a good tool to have. But we start tonight with Luke chapter 18. So let's look at Luke chapter 18. We'll start with the first eight verses. Luke 18, 1 through 8. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect, who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This has always been an interesting parable to me, and what helps to understand it, I believe, is how Luke introduces it. If we leave off the introduction, it's a little bit of a strange story here, but Luke gives us the reason before the conclusion. So it's a little bit like the explanation comes first, and it helps because this story is a little bit strange. The main point of whatever Jesus is about to say is that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. So this is the conclusion. We have the conclusion before the story itself. In the story, we have this unrighteous king. He doesn't fear God. He doesn't respect his fellow human beings. And so really, it's unfortunate that this man is a judge. And it's not just that he's not religious. It's not just that he's not God-fearing. But it's that he doesn't respect the people that he's judging. We know today that judges uh, hold an incredibly important role in our society. In our society, we have lawmakers. Uh, we have law enforcers, and then we have judges, and the judges determine how the laws are enforced. And I know many times in Madison, our issues go back to the judges. Uh, the issues with crime that we're having uh, go back to some very uh, limited 
I guess we'd say penalties on some of the crimes that we're seeing. I've talked to a number of police officers here in Madison who arrest people for some pretty serious burglaries and shootings between cars and so on, but the people they arrest are out within a few hours. And so they do the same thing again, and the police have to go catch them again and again and again. And sometimes they have to be rearrested before they even uh, go to court for some of the previous charges. So that's a judge problem. Judges play an important role in our society. And it's a judge problem in the story Jesus tells here as well. There's a widow coming to the judge for some kind of legal protection today. Maybe we would refer to this as some kind of a restraining order. She wants the judge to do something. The judge, though, ignores the woman. The woman keeps coming back, though, over and over again. And it gets to the point where the judge finally decides to give the woman what she wants. <laughs> Not because it's the right thing to do. He doesn't do this to please God. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't do this because he respects the woman in any way. But he grants this request only because she bothers him. And the judge realizes that if she keeps coming back again and again, uh, she might wear him out. As I understand it, this phrase goes back to the idea of getting a black eye. And some of your translations might reflect that. In other words, I don't care about the woman, but if she keeps coming, she's going to make me look bad. <laughs> uh, she's going to beat me down. She's going to give me a black eye. Now, the issue some people have with this parable is that they see Jesus comparing God to an unrighteous judge. And if we didn't have the explanation, we might be thinking along those lines. But obviously, that is not the point of the parable. The point according to Luke up in verse 1, is that all times we ought to pray and not to lose heart. And so if an unrighteous judge listens to a persistent widow, then how much more will God who loves us listen to us when we pray? Obviously, if we cry out night and day, God will listen to us. And so the comparison is not really between God and the judge, but the comparison is between us and the widow. We are the widow in this story. And like the widow, we need to be praying regularly, per persistent prayer is the point here. Notice at the end, Jesus throws in a rather unusual question. He says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What in the world is that about? And in the context of persistent prayer, I'm thinking Jesus might be wondering when he returns, will people still be praying? Or will they have given up on prayer before then? And that's how this applies to us. We are the persistent widow. The Lord has not returned for the final time yet. And so Jesus, in the meantime, is encouraging us to go to God persistently in prayer. Let's move on and go to Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Luke 18, 9 through 14. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I pay tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector standing some distance away was unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Well, we're in an interesting little series of parables here because once again, Luke pretty much explains the parable before he tells us about it. And this one, he says, is aimed at some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. And so whatever Jesus is about to teach, the goal, I think, is to encourage change in those who trusted in their own righteousness and treated others in that way. So the story is two people go up to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, one is a tax collector. I mean, that's quite the contrast. Remember, the Pharisees were a sect of the Jews. They believed in spirits and the afterlife, but they were total hypocrites. Many of them were. They followed many parts of the law of Moses, but they missed the main point. They never really loved God or their neighbors, which are both main points of the law. The other guy is a tax collector, and again, uh, even today, tax collectors are not the most beloved members of society. Um, for some of us, yesterday was tax day again. Uh, yesterday was the day we had to send our quarterly payments to the IRS and the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. If you're self-employed or dual status as I am, your employer does not withhold taxes out of your paycheck. Uh, but instead, you have to estimate your taxes. This is what I think I might owe. 
and then mail a check every quarter, April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. And as you might have noticed, uh, those four dates are not spread evenly through the year. We only have two months between April and June, and then four months between September and January. It's weird, and <laughs> it does not make sense all the time. You know, we love this country. We thank God for having income that needs to be taxed. That is an awesome blessing. But even in this land of freedom and opportunity, very few people enjoy paying taxes. <laughs> Almost nobody that I know of enjoys writing that check. Uh, for years, I had to go to the local IRS office in person to pick up a blank W-2, W-3. This, this is not a form that you could just walk in a library or post office and pick up. It was in, you know, five or six copies, duplicate with the carbon and all that kind of thing for years. So it's not something you could just print out off the internet. And so, no, you had to go to the office and stand in line for the privilege of getting the form so you could pay your taxes. And I can tell you, nobody was happy to be standing in that line. <laughs> the line at the IRS office, that's a line full of grumpy people. They're not happy about being there. Everybody's tense. And obviously, I feel sorry for the IRS people behind the behind the glass there. It would be a stressful job, I would imagine, to deal with grouchy taxpayers all day long. But what is true for us in a free country today is so much more true of Israel back in the winter of 2930 AD. Uh, tax collectors were Jew Jewish people who had won the bid for the privilege of collecting taxes from their own people on behalf of the Roman government, which was an occupying force at that time. So these tax collectors were absolutely hated. So this is the setup. There's a Pharisee, a religious leader, very zealous in his faith, and then a tax collector. These two men go into the temple to pray. And right there, most people would assume that the Pharisee is the good guy and the tax collector is the bad guy in this story. However, the Pharisee stands there and he's praying to himself. I hope we caught that there. Very interesting how Luke makes sure we understand this. The Pharisee is praying to himself. And so he's not praying to God. He's praying to himself. He's making a speech uh, that really only he can hear. God isn't hearing this prayer. The prayer stops when it hits the ceiling of the temple. The prayer bounces back. Uh, this prayer is marked return to sender. And the reason is he's arrogant and he's condescending. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Oh, those other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector over here. And so he even has somebody very specific in mind. And he says, I, I fast twice a week. In other words, I go far beyond what the law requires. I pay tithes of all that I get. In other words, this man is praising himself. God, you sure are lucky to have a person like me as one of your followers. The tax collector, though, standing off to the side somewhere, was unwilling even to lift his eyes up to heaven. And so he's humble. He's beating his chest. And his prayer is, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. That has to be one of the most simple prayers that we could ever pray, isn't it? It's basically, dear God, help me. Be merciful to me, the sinner. Years ago when I set up my Facebook account, it asked for my religious views. <laughs> How do you summarize what your religious views are in, in one sentence? And, and so that's what I put for that. To me, this is a summary of the Christian faith. What are my religious views? My religious views are, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. In my mind, that pretty much summarizes what the Christian faith is all about. And the Lord's uh, conclusion here completely reverses what most people would have thought when they saw a Pharisee and a tax collector walk into the temple. The tax collector is the man who went home justified that day. Somebody explained to me years ago, justified. You can remember that because when we're justified, it's just as if I'd never sinned. And so we are justified in the sight of God. Uh, the tax collector goes home justified, but the Pharisee does not. And the reason is, the Pharisee exalts himself, but the tax collector humbles himself. God does not appreciate arrogance, but he values humility. That's basically what we learned this past Lord's Day, isn't it? From Proverbs chapter 6, God, among other things, hates haughty eyes, eyes that look down on other people. And that's exactly what the Pharisee was doing. 
All right, in the Harmony of the Gospels, if you're following along in that way, uh, you might notice that we have Matthew 19, 1 through 12, and Mark 10, 1 through 12, inserted right here in chronological order. As you might remember, these passages are both about divorce and remarriage. Uh, the Pharisees come to Jesus with a challenge. They're testing him. They don't like this parable Jesus just told, uh, cutting on their own guy for praying. And so they come in with a trick question, and they want to know, whether a man can divorce his wife for any reason at all. And they're hoping to get Jesus to either contradict the law of Moses, which would put him on the outs with people, or say something incredibly unpopular that would make him lose support from the public. So instead of playing that game, Jesus seems to bypass the law of Moses, and he takes them all the way back to the beginning. And so in terms of marriage, God has always intended for one man and one woman to be together for life. That's God's plan for marriage in a nutshell. One man, one woman, together for a lifetime. And in Matthew 19, 9, of course, Jesus gives one exception to a lifelong marriage. If one spouse is guilty of sexual sin, the other can divorce and get remarried. The point is, this gets inserted here in chronological order. So we pick up now with uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 15. Luke 18, 15 through 17. And uh, since this is found in three of the four gospel accounts, uh, just for this time, I'm putting all three up here by way of comparison, especially since it's a shorter passage and we can fit these on the screen like we, we can't with all of them. But this gives us some idea of how the harmony might help. Uh, we'll be reading Luke's account and then we'll be bringing in some thoughts and details from the others. So Luke 18, 15 through 17. And they were bringing even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. First of all, I just want us to notice and not miss this, that people are bringing their children to Jesus so that he could touch them, that is, to lay their hands on them, as the other accounts say, and to pray for them, according to Matthew. Uh, we're not told specifically that the parents are the ones bringing the children. I'm thinking it's pretty safe to assume that it's the parents bringing the children. We're just not told. Um, but let's learn from this, I think, that as parents, it's good to try to connect our children with Jesus. That's a very basic lesson here. These parents see Jesus. They must know something about who he is and what he's teaching. And they conclude, we need this man to pray for our children. And so this is good. However, when the disciples see what's happening, they rebuke them. Uh, they reprimand the parents. And I'm, I'm assuming they see the kids as a distraction. Uh, they probably see the kids as an interruption. However, instead of rebuking the parents or the children, Jesus basically rebukes the disciples. He corrects them. And he doesn't want the children stopped because he says the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then he goes on and suggests that those who do not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. There are some good qualities to children, loving, trusting, accepting, and so on. Uh, Matthew adds that he lays his hands on these kids. Mark tells us that he takes the kids in his arms. And so he, you know, has them on, on his lap, hugs them, and plays with them. Who knows what, what's going on there? Blesses them, lays his hands on them. Um, so in the picture there, Jesus loves children. And I don't know if this is how we always think of Jesus. We think of him, at least I do, primarily as a, as a teacher, as a preacher in front of huge crowds and so on. But he's also very comfortable getting mobbed by a bunch of kids, isn't he? He's comfortable with that. He loves spending time with kids. Kids are messy. <laughs> kids are germ magnets. Kids are germ slingers. Uh, kids are noisy. And they're messy, but Jesus loves children, and he loves spending time with children. And uh, there's a lot that we can learn from that, a lot that we can learn from little children. All right, let's keep going then to Luke 18, verses 18 through 23. Luke 18, 18 through 23. A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. 
And so here we come to the parable of the rich young ruler. You may have a Bible with that heading in the, before this paragraph. Uh, this is also found in Matthew 19 and in Mark chapter 10. We just don't have room on the uh, screen for all of that without the, the print getting too small. Uh, Luke refers to him as being a ruler who was extremely rich. Matthew refers to him as being young. And Matthew and Mark both refer to him as owning much property. And so all together, when we combine Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is the parable of the rich young ruler, although all three of those descriptions are not found in uh, one of those accounts just spread out. Uh, we have to combine all three to come up with that description. So this is the rich young ruler. Uh, this ruler comes to Jesus and wants to know what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. That's a great question, isn't it? If people would ask that more often, that'd be awesome. This is one of the best questions that anybody could ever ask. But instead of praising the young man for asking this good question, notice Jesus seems to challenge him. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And yet he doesn't let the young man answer. Jesus plows ahead and plows forward and reminds him of the commandments. In other words, Jesus points the man back to the word of God. And that's a good move at this point. That's a good move for us at this point. If somebody wants to know, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? We have scripture for that. And so we can take them to the word of God, not to some kind of creed book, not to a website or, or prayer that isn't found in the Bible, but we take them to the word of God. By the way, I would note that's why we have the capital letters in most translations in verse 20. Uh, Jesus is not shouting. I know today we see all caps online and that's somebody shouting, somebody's angry. Uh, but in most translations, the way it's laid out, uh, many of our translators uh, use the all caps to indicate a direct quote from the Old Testament. So just a quick formatting note there. Uh, not to get stressed out, Jesus isn't angry here. Uh, Matthew adds a little bit and tells us Jesus tells him to keep the commandments and the man asks which ones and then Jesus responds with this list. So the lists are somewhat different between the three accounts. All three include murder, adultery, stealing, bearing false witness, and honoring mother and father. Mark adds do not defraud. Matthew adds you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so the man wants to know what to do. Jesus tells him and this man says well I've pretty much done all of that from the time I was a kid. And so looking at that, I'm kind of wondering, is that realistic? Is this really the world's only perfect man besides the Lord himself? And I know we look at this response and we might see this as being a little bit arrogant, but that doesn't really seem to be what's going on here. Jesus doesn't really respond with a condemnation here. Uh, at least not direct, not very severe. At this point, Mark says, and looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. And so this wasn't like one of the Pharisees that he's replying pretty harshly to. This is uh, somebody that he loves. There's something going on here. So he's not condemning him for being arrogant. But notice Jesus does point out that one thing is missing. And he goes on and he says, one thing you still lack, if you want to be complete, go and sell everything you possess and give it to the poor and then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me now, what's strange is as far as i can tell this is the only place that we find this in the bible as far as i can tell nowhere else does god demand that we sell absolutely everything and give it to the poor we are to help the poor we're not to be dominated by a sense of greed and so on there are some commandments toward those uh toward those ideas but why the direct command to sell absolutely everything here. I, I wish we could discuss this in person, but it seems to me the one huge advantage Jesus has that we do not is that Jesus knows this young man's heart. Jesus knows that this man values his stuff more than he values God. He can keep the commandments. He's avoided murdering anybody up to this point in his life. You know, good job, you've done the thing. You haven't murdered anybody. He's not a liar. He loves his mom and dad, but God is not quite number one in his life right now. And Jesus knows this. And so the command is, sell everything and give it away. When he hears this, though, he becomes very sad. His face falls, according to Mark. He goes away grieved, according to Matthew and Mark. And so he leaves. 
There are a few things I find interesting here. First of all, the man just leaves. And he leaves without saying anything to Jesus. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't respond. He doesn't argue. He doesn't justify himself. He doesn't defend himself in any way. He doesn't say, but Jesus, Moses never said to sell everything. Nothing like that. But he just walks away. What does that tell us? It tells us he knows that what Jesus is saying here is true. There is a real problem in his life. And so I would take this as him being convicted of his sin. In other words, he knows what Jesus is saying here is true. Secondly, what I find is interesting also is that although he seems to be convicted of his sin, he chooses to not do anything about it. And that's terrifying, isn't it? It's a bit terrifying to think about, but there are some things we might choose to do more than God, that we love certain things or certain sins more than we love God. And we have that ability. But there's something else that surprises me, and that is Jesus lets the man leave, doesn't he? The young man walks away, and Jesus lets him go. Jesus doesn't chase him down. He doesn't argue with him. He doesn't beg or plead. But when the young man turns and walks away, Jesus allows him to make that decision. And I would point out, Jesus allows us to do the same thing today. If we leave, we leave. And obviously it breaks the Lord's heart, but we're not prisoners to the Christian faith. Christian faith is a choice that we make. We serve him willingly. As this young man is leaving, Jesus does make one comment, and that's what leads us to the next paragraph. So let's move on and let us continue then with Luke chapter 18, verses 24 through 30. Luke 18, 24 through 30. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, The things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Peter said, Behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. And so it seems that the application of the interaction with the rich young ruler is the warning that it is truly difficult for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. This is according to Jesus. What I find interesting here is that we really don't hear this about any other sin, do we? As far as I can tell, Jesus never says that it's difficult for homosexuals or adulterers to enter the kingdom of God. He never says it's difficult for liars or gossips to enter the kingdom of God. He never says it's difficult for murderers to enter the kingdom of God. But instead, as far as I can tell, the only warning he gives concerning it being truly difficult to enter the kingdom is this warning given to the wealthy and that should be very sobering to us. We are wealthy. Even the poorest among us in our congregation probably have a television, probably have a phone or two, have a place to live, pretty good supply of food. And so in terms of the world at large, we are wealthy. And so when Jesus says that it's difficult for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom, we need to be paying attention to that. At this point in the harmony, you might notice that Mark has something Matthew and Luke do not. Mark says in Mark 10, 24, that the disciples are amazed at his words. Jesus then continues in all three accounts with the saying that's now famous. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Interestingly, Luke uses a different Greek word for needle than Matthew and Mark use. Matthew and Mark refer to a needle that was used for sewing, a sewing needle. Luke, though, uses a word that is only used here in the New Testament. And some scholars have suggested that he's referring to a surgeon's needle, a needle that was used to give people stitches. As I was researching the word that Luke uses here, I learned that we have an English word based on this Greek word, bellinophobia. Bellinophobia, referring to an abnormal fear of sharply pointed objects, specifically needles. And so when you go to the doctor, you can tell them uh, that you have a case of bellinophobia and impress them with your knowledge of the Greek language. But it's interesting to me 
that Luke uses a different word for needle than Matthew and Mark do. Um, remember his background, he is the beloved physician, and so he's got something else on his mind uh, when he hears this. Let's not miss the lesson though, and it's a very serious message communicated with a bit of humor. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, either a sewing needle or a surgeon's needle, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So now we're thinking about a camel squeezing through the eye of a needle. That's pretty funny, isn't it? But it's not happening. Some have suggested that there might have been a gate through the wall around Jerusalem, a gate known as the eye of the needle because it was so small. So a camel would need to crouch down just like we need to humble ourselves before God and all that. Okay, well, maybe, maybe not. But the best interpretation of this passage, I believe, is probably the most simple. It is really, really hard for the rich to be saved. And I say this because that's the way the disciples interpreted this, and they were there. And when they hear that Jesus say this, their response is, who then can be saved? Matthew and Mark both tell us that the disciples are very astonished and even more astonished. And Jesus explains that it's not impossible impossible. What is impossible with men is possible with God. With God, all things are possible, as Matthew puts it. In other words, if you're rich and if you want to be saved, God will make it happen. But it is difficult. At this point, Peter speaks up, and Peter realizes that he and the other disciples really have left everything to follow Jesus. In Luke, Peter says that they've left their homes behind. In Matthew and Mark, Peter says they've left everything behind. And personally, I'm almost expecting some kind of condemnation here from Jesus. No, Peter, you shouldn't be thinking like that or something like that. But Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus almost seems to agree, doesn't he? And he seems to acknowledge this. Yes, Peter, you have left everything. And then he goes on to explain that there are some benefits to living the Christian faith. We might give up some physical possessions here and there. We might lose close friends and family here and there. But we also gain some things. Mark tells us that we gain a hundred times as much uh, now and in the age to come eternal life. And that's true, isn't it? Many of us, as a part of the Four Lakes congregation, we're a long ways from parents and grandparents and friends and family and brothers and sisters. But the church is our family wherever we go. When we moved to Madison, I was 600 miles away from my own grandparents. But you know what? We pretty much adopted Marge Holden, who lived out on Mineral Point Road a mile or two straight west of the West Side Target. Uh, we considered her to be our adopted grandmother. And uh, we know for a fact that Marge prayed for us by name every single day. She reminded of that, uh, us of that regularly. And in exchange, uh, we changed her light bulbs and we changed her smoke alarm batteries. We would pick her up for church and uh, take her out to Cottage Cafe every Sunday. We gained a grandmother, didn't we? And, you know, I could check in on my grandparents down in the Nashville, Tennessee area. And I know that they had Christian family down there uh, beyond physical family. They had Christian family who would take care of them. And so we decided we'll take care of another grandmother. She'll be our adopted Christian grandmother. And I know some of you can say the same thing. Yes, uh, we do give up some things in this life to be a Christian, but we also gain some things as well. All right, that brings us to the end of our study. I hope the wind has not been too much of a distraction to you or the birds or, or the train that came by about 20 minutes ago. It is looking absolutely beautiful. I don't know if you can see the sun or the reflection behind me. I can see it in the computer uh, a little bit off the, off the screen there. Just a beautiful thing. I've been alone here all day except for one car that drove uh, through briefly and said I'm staying away from that guy probably. Uh, but hope to put the kayak in and then get this class uploaded later in the day today. Thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Uh, be sure to send me any prayer concerns so I can get those in the bulletin. And next week, let's come prepared for our next study. I know we're not all the way through Luke 18. We've only made it part way through, but we'll look at the rest of Luke 18 and uh, maybe make it part way into Luke 19 as well. But let's close tonight with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of grace. We ask tonight that you would be merciful to us as sinners. We realize and confess tonight that we are truly wealthy. By the world's standards, we have been tremendously blessed. We pray, Father, that our wealth would not be a hindrance to our obedience, but instead we ask that we would use our abundant resources to help others in the name of your Son. We pray that we might always put you first and that our wealth would not be a distraction. We come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son. 
our Lord and our Savior. Amen. See you on Sunday.